for all of you being here. My name is Beth Ann Patrick. I am a proud board member of 1455 Lit Arts. And <laughs> thank you, we're so excited. This inaugural literary festival is just going great. Can we get a round of applause for 1455? Thank you. And Sean Murphy. Um, and so, you know, I'm the, the poor board member, so I'm singing for my supper by doing as much as I possibly can. And it's also a joy because this is what I do all the time. So uh, I am a full-time book critic, reviewer, and also an author. And uh, I am here with three of my fellow book critics, authors, freelance writers. Some of us are not freelance. We'll get to that in a moment. We've been, and we, we've done all kinds of configurations of work. We writers on writing. So um, I'm going to introduce um, the panelists in a moment, and uh, but I want to tell you a joke first because it's the perfect writer's joke as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Maybe you won't agree. <laughs> so a writer dies and winds up in hell, and in hell there are rows and rows of writers in cubicles typing away madly, being lashed with whips. Sweat is pouring from their foreheads, maybe blood too, like writers do. And as this is happening, the writer says, well, I don't want to go here. Can we go to heaven instead? St. Peter says, sure, let's go to heaven. And they go to heaven. And there are rows and rows of writers in cubicles, sweating, being lashed, typing away. And the writer says, but I thought this is heaven. And St. Peter says, it is because here you get published. <laughs> Sorry, that one gets me every time. <laughs> so um, one of the things we're going to talk about today is, you know, being published and making your living as a writer, because there are many different ways. And let me just introduce my wonderful panelists to you. Um, first to my left is Nora Krug, and Nora is a an editor at the Washington Post, so she has a full-time job. She's also a writer, and she's an editor and writer for Book World. She's worked for the Washington Post since 2007 and began at the Post writing a books column, later became a co-editor of the Weekly Health and Science section. Her articles and columns have appeared in Health, Book World, Local Living, and Parenting. Before joining the Post, she was an editor at the New York Times and Architectural Digest. And Nora's also freelanced in the past, so we'll talk about that. And next to Nora is Jacob Silverman, who is the author of Terms of Service, Social Media and the Price of Constant Connection. Since I spend a lot of my time on Twitter, we'll be talking about that. He's a contributing editor for The Baffler. If you haven't checked out that site, you really should. And like too many other writers, he lives in Brooklyn. I can <laughs> And finally, last but not least, we've got um, Marion Winnick, uh, my friend, a former colleague uh, on the National Book Critics Circle. And um, Marion has been a writer for, oh, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to pull up this darn bio. Excuse me, this is always what happens to me, and I can't find, uh, here we go. Marion Winnick is the author of The Baltimore Book of the Dead. We're going to hear from that in a moment. She's the winner of the 2019 Towson Prize for Literature, First Comes Love, and Eight Other Books. Her column at BaltimoreFishbowl.com has received the Best Column and Best Humorist Awards from Baltimore Magazine, and her essays have been published in the New York Times Magazine, The Sun, and elsewhere. She's the host of the Weekly Reader radio show and podcast based at the Baltimore NPR affiliate. She reviews books for Newsday, People, and Kirkus Reviews, and is a board member of the National Book Critics Circle. She's a professor in the MFA program at the University of Baltimore. Thank you all for being here. Thanks. Round of applause for our panelists. Absolutely. And um, I can tell you more about me, but that's boring. I'd rather hear from someone about writing. And so Marion's latest book, The Baltimore Book of the Dead, follows her, the Glenn Rock Book of the Dead. The Baltimore Book of the Dead is from Counterpoint Press. And the reason I'm having her read the specific couple of pieces we're going to hear from her today, because they are about writers and authors, and we're going to talk about 
why we all, the four of us, continue to write about books and authors in various ways, and you know what that means for us, among other things. So, Marion, if you would read your piece about Philip Roth, please. Uh, I just want to explain that both of these books. Here, uh, can, can you hear me? No. no? Okay. <laughs> all right. Both of these books have um, very short vignettes about people that I either knew or who touched my life that died. And there's not, most of them are not famous people, but there's some famous people. And then, uh, like, there's Prince and David Bowie and Lou Reed and there's Philip Roth. And so, anyway, and did I say they're all 400 words or less? Um, the professor of, oh, and I, I don't use people's names. Um, in the case of famous people, this really doesn't matter much because they're, it's obvious who they are. But it, so that's why I'll be sort of, it's sort of coy that I don't say his name. The Professor of Desire, died 2018. How does a Jewish American princess call her children for dinner? One of the many failed fiction projects of my life was an attempt to write the female answer to Portnoy's complaint, <laughs> a book whose energy, humor, and outrageousness I found electrifying. I was in love with his writing from the minute I opened Goodbye Columbus and Aunt Gladys says, Potemkin, I don't know, and what, I should serve four different dinners? <laughs> that fiction. It was like the time I had coleslaw in a Jewish deli in Montreal and I started weeping because of the coleslaw of my childhood. But there was something else in the work that didn't go down so easily. His women, do we call them love interests, were so wildly sexualized I couldn't recognize anyone I knew. But, but what if I took it as a literary challenge, if I could turn it around and show men as they appeared to us? Let them be the inscrutable, crazy-making objects for once. The father would have to be a superhuman figure, like Mrs. Portnoy. The mother? Hmm. Let's give her an affair with the rabbi. Uh, of course, there would have to be a lot of masturbation. Well, what can I say? Pogroms are for everybody. <laughs> That's the punchline of a joke too terrible to explain. Wait, here's an idea. I could start every chapter with a Jap joke. Let's leave me at my desk, writing this magnum opus in 1997, and flash back a few years. Driving to San Antonio to hear him read from Patrimony, my set of the $1.50 Bantam paperbacks beside me, dreaming of what I will say when we meet. Really, we are already family. During the Q&A, someone asks him how the changes in American mores over his long career have affected his work. Oh, he says, I think it's my work that has affected American mores. <laughs> Still, after the reading, I shyly approach the podium, one other besotted fan racing me up there. Quickly, a handler steps between us. There will be no autographs. So, no, I never got to speak to him. And I never finished my novel. Still, when I read and reread him, which I will for the rest of my life, even if he was a little arrogant and not very friendly, I still have to close the book every now and then in frustration at the size of his genius. How does a Jewish American princess call her children for dinner? Get in the car! Thank you. I'm sorry we only have one mic because it doesn't allow for as much free flowing conversation as I would like. But what I want to start with here. Um, because it will lead to other discussions about writing is Marion, you and Nora and I spend a lot of time reviewing books, profiling authors, talking to authors. Jacob, I imagine you still do some book reviews yeah. and work with authors and we all, we, most of us are authors um, ourselves. So what is it, this is my opening Sally, what is it about talking to writers and writing about their work that can consume other writers? Is that a fair question? Sure. Editor, you first. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I mean, one of my favorite things to do is to, is to profile other writers and um, just find out the story behind the story, I guess. Um, uh, I know I've written some profiles of various uh, writers, some well-known and some not so. And um, you know, there's all sorts of things that you don't know and maybe think from the book. But when you meet them in person, like I was talking about Marion's book I read and loved long ago, um, you find something else about about them, and then you can 
share it with the world and um, people get a different sense of who the person is behind the book and what they decide to tell you in the book and what they decide not to tell you in the book. Um, I can take it from there. Yes. Yes. Go for it. Just that um, I love to read. I'm a big fan girl of so many writers. It's a, to me, it's just a dream to do this. You know, it's a, I I lie around and read books all day long, and that's my job. <laughs> you know, we'll discuss later that it's not a very well-paying job. But, you know, every day we I I that. cannot believe it. I mean, I just can't believe that this is a thing that I get to read for money. And um, I, you know, over, the thing about it is, you know, you don't love every book, so it's not always, um, you, you know, it takes a certain amount of courage to write reviews that aren't positive, and especially when you're a writer yourself. But anyway, I mean, for me, this is a dream job, and that's why I do it. I, I guess I'll add that um, I agree with, with much of what's been said. I think there's a sort of a personal pleasure in, in kind of being able to ask some of the questions that have been nagging you when you read an author's work. Mm -hmm. Sometimes though I wonder, I mean, it's like, do we want to meet our heroes? There's a little bit of necessary distance sometimes between you and a writer, but it's obviously a different kind of relationship when you're doing this professionally and you're trying to present an author and a more, for a public audience to kind of um, offer a more well-rounded uh, picture of who this person is. But I think on a personal level, sometimes that sort of mystery and that distance between uh, author and subject between yourself and an author and their work uh, can be really helpful. I, and I'll tell a story about that. Um, well, you know, there, there are always the, the negative stories. There's um, the time I was doing a radio interview with um, an author who is revered. And, uh, you know, I had a, 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 a <laughs> uh, maybe, uh, maybe, but uh, you know, I showed up right on time. I wasn't five minutes early, which is really on time. And the author was just furious, really late, really late. And I thought, oh, this is supposed to be such a warm, fuzzy person. What is going on here? And once the author realized that I actually read the book and knew about it and knew my job, it was fine. But authors can sometimes be prickly with us, you know. But I think what Jacob was just saying about, you know, wanting to meet some of these heroes, I, I just wanted to say that that is exactly why I got into, I, I got into freelance writing specifically because I was a following spouse for many years. My husband was active duty in the Army. And I tried teaching and I... I'm one of those people who loathe it. And uh, that's how I got into freelancing. And we'll hear about how Nora got into freelancing as well, even though she now has the full-time job, the dream. Uh, but I also want to talk about um, the coverage now for authors and book reviews, because we all know that it's changed. We all know that it's difficult right now. Um, book sections, book pages, they've all you know, gone down. Um, there's a lot on the web. Is it, it's not necessarily well paid, as Jacob and I and Marianne can attest. And we're not going to make you talk about rates, nor don't you worry. But um, why, do we, um, why do we continue um, to write any kind of freelance pieces? What, is, what are the advantages of freelancing for people out in the audience who might be freelancers or might be thinking about writing pieces? I'm not sure I can answer this. <laughs> I need <Try>. you. Uh, <laughs> I think you should tell your story. Yes. Yeah. No, about how, how, how you became a freelancer. Exactly. Oh, this is so long ago. I don't even know it's relevant. I, I mean, I, I had another full-time job. Can you get to the microphone? Sure. I was working in book publishing many, many years ago, and I uh, decided that <clears throat> I wasn't making enough money and needed to find another job. And I decided also at the same time that I was going to become a book critic, um, even though I was 25 years old and had no clips. Um, so <laughs> I was like, well, I, I work a in girl can dream. Yeah, I was like, I work in book publishing, I can write, I'll just do it. Um, so I applied for, I called everybody that I knew and I said I needed to get a job and eventually someone said, well, there's this really, really, um, really entry level job for you at the New York Times. It is 
letters to the editor. I was literally, I mean, this is a time in the 1990s when people literally sent letters, and I opened them. Um, so I, I'm getting ahead of myself. So I accepted the job, but this was going to just be my, my part-time job. I would get in really early. I opened all the mail. I did all write a book. And I was, no, I was going to become a book critic. So I sat in my office, and I read a book. <laughs> and then I just wrote a book review. <laughs> and I printed it out on a piece of paper, or actually it was probably about three pieces of paper, and I stapled it together, and I sent it in a literal envelope, and I sent it to every editor at every magazine in New York, thinking, of course they're going to hire me. <laughs> and amazingly enough, I did get uh, several offers um, at the time, <laughs> which is completely still shocking to me. Um, I mean, some were better than others. Some were just sort of like reading books, like pre-reading books for people um, to tell them what books I thought they should review. Which they, actually paid once upon a time. Which actually paid once upon a time. And then I did get a, um, a contract at Vogue to um, write book reviews for them. Um, which I did for a time while I was writing, while I was editing at the New York Times. Then eventually, I started writing book reviews for the New York Times because I was there. Um, and then I just kind of eventually just like made myself visible, I guess, by doing my work that I was asked to do um, in the most efficient and best way that I could, and then using my downtime, which I, before I had children, used to have. <laughs> And in that time, I would write and I would pitch, and um, you know, since I had a job anyway, it, the pressure to sell my other pieces wasn't as as big because I, I had this other path that I could still take. Um, but that was many years ago. Nobody prints on paper anymore. Let's let's yeah. talk about more recently, Jacob. <laughs> okay. You know, and, and, uh, what it's like out there pitching pieces. You know, shorter pieces like like book or, you know, front of book pieces to magazines and... Sure. Uh, I mean, what the experience is like? Yeah, because it, you know, Nora was talking earlier uh, with Vogue, you know, it's a thousand dollars per, you know, little review, right, you know, right. things like that. It's, a, it's not quite as easy to send out a review and get three or four offers anymore, is it? I, I wouldn't think so, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I think... Or any pitch. Yeah, there are a lot of... That's a magical story. That's why I wanted to hear it twice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my my own experience with freelancing has been much more checkered, and uh, and I'm sort of uh, I'm definitely cynical about it, but continue to bash my head against the wall and pursue it. Um, I think one be benefit of things these days is there are so many publications, and there are a lot of kind of below the radar pu publications that are doing really good work, or publications that you may not think of as even doing cultural journalism or something like that, but they do have a, a section on their website or something like that, that that is also publishing interesting writers now and then. Um, I, I think you have to have sort of a more like small c Catholic sensibility in that there you have like top 10 lists sitting alongside uh, 2,000 word reviews sometimes. I think unfortunately there's less of the latter um, and less room for essays and really considered thought. Um, so I, I, if I had any simple advice for pitching those kinds of pieces, I would just say be ready for rejection and don't take it too personally. But also, you know, be polite, treat people how you'd want to be treated. I mean, it's, people can sometimes, there are many great kind-hearted freelancers out there, but I know there are also people who operate kind of with a sense of assumption, like of course you'd want to publish this. So um, <laughs> I think approaching the process with some humility and also just in a, and to another practical note, um, know what's being published, know the landscape, yep. know that you're probably not going to be able to review a book that came out six months or a year ago, though sometimes that does happen, uh, and it's great when a publication isn't totally pegged to the news cycle, but many do operate under some kind of quota or pressure to just be responsive to the news cycle, so, you know, they're going to get a lot of queries about reviewing the new Trump book by some Trump insider, but of course that's something that they have to review. Whereas, like, I've done a lot of reviewing uh, fiction and translation less in recent years because uh, there's certainly not that much demand for that kind of thing. But if you find your, your, your niches and find your places that do want to publish that kind of thing, then you can start some successful relationships. Let me um, interject something, and then we can talk to Marianne more about this. Uh, you were just mentioning lists. And yeah. um, Nora can kick me if I give any information about, 
I write a monthly column for the Post now about the top, they're not the best books of the month per se, because they're really my choices, but, and I hope I pick really good ones, but the thing about it is it's 10 books, you know, I have to choose from all the thousands, and, and in that column, it's not just novels, I'm choosing, you know, memoirs and cookbooks and history and other kinds of nonfiction, um, and I do read a lot. But that is still a lot of truth. But what's so fascinating about that list, as opposed to the reviews that I write, that Nora writes, that Marianne writes, that Ron Charles writes, is that um, this list has taken off. It's just getting a huge amount of traffic. And the reason I'm mentioning that is not to, well, I am you know, tooting my own home, sorry. But to say that the way we consume cultural material has changed. And Marion, um, especially because you have been writing book reviews for a lot of different places, newspaper. Um, I also review for NPR. You review on the air. I review um, in text for NPR. But um, let's talk a little bit about how you've seen the landscape change since you began. Because like you, I get to read all day. And it doesn't make me rich, but it makes me very happy. Well, um, there was a huge change in the landscape and everything else in 2008 and 2009, as everybody knows. So before that, I made a significant part of my living doing freelance writing for women's magazines, like writing a, you know, five milestones that tell you your marriage is going to end, and you know, <laughs> I wrote about stuff about sex for Cosmopolitan and Red Book, and I wrote for brides, and you know, and there was a lot of this work, and most of it paid a dollar a word. And it was great. Oh, for those days. Yeah, yes, yeah. That, that's so over. Um, I have not written an article like that since 2008 or 2009 because after the, whatever we want to call it, um, the <laughs> crash, uh, you know, magazines started using staffers a lot more for a lot of a function. But in book reviewing, it's really the bulk of it is done by freelance because not that many places have full-time people on staff that are going to be book reviewers. Mm -hmm. So um, there are book editors that, and you know, people do, some people do have a staff, but most publications and online things use freelancers. So book reviewing is an area where it's still possible. And um, how, I mean, uh, let me think. My radio show is, it's a podcast too. It's a four minute show that's on um, once a week on this um, Baltimore NPR station, and then it's also a podcast. So really, I feel like there's a lot of different ways into this if you want to be into it. Like a lot of people start literary blogs, and these literary blogs actually get popular. And once you have a, a literary blog, you can get advanced copies of books that are you know, they're coming out. You have to get books that are coming out in about six months or three months if you want to review, because once the book is published, all the reviews have already been written. So, um, but you can have a pop, you know, you can, we can all have podcasts and blogs and all these things. There's so much more way into it. And honestly, there's, you know, you, of course you don't make any money for your podcast or your blog, but you make so little money from doing the paid work that there's not much difference. <laughs> when I started reviewing for Kirkus, which I do a lot of, and you'll hear why, um, the first, I said, how much is it for the review? And she said, it's $50. And I had been used to getting like $300 a review, which is pretty much normal for newspapers and stuff. And I'm like, $50? What? And, um, you know, she said, oh, well, you'll see. There's kind of a formula. It's not that hard. I'm like, mm. so I, would, I told her, well, don't send me more than one a month because I can't really afford to do things that are $50. Well, now I do like 13 a month. <laughs> I, I got addicted to it. I literally am addicted to it. I can't. I, <laughs> <laughs> and when you do 13, you get up to like $600. So, but yeah, so anyway. That's hilarious. <laughs> and I, I was just going to say also, I mean, if you like have a literary blog or like you're on Twitter or somewhere out in the, out in online, and someone like me comes along and sees your work, um, you know, there's probably a larger chance that like you might be interested in having me do something because you already sort of, you know, you don't have to be like Philip Roth or Pretty 
I mean, <laughs> you don't have to be a big name to be able to write for the post. I mean, How many people in here are interested in, in becoming a book critic or doing book reviews? Okay. Well, See? maybe we should be okay. okay. Yeah. Fair amount. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's not, what I was also going to say is it's not just about being the book critic. It's also about, as um, Jacob and Marion already mentioned, um, if you are, how many people's, how many people's, it's late for me in the day, people. Um, how many of you have written or are working on a book? See, and so I, this is my, my little transition here. So what I was gonna say is, um, first of all, as Mary and Jacob said, do not pitch a book that has already been published. Um, especially if you want it reviewed in a regular trade publication. As I mentioned yesterday in the YA panel that I moderated, um, you may write a stunning piece of work and self-publish it. You are not going to have it reviewed in the Washington Post. And that is not because Nora and Stephanie, the editor of Book World, and all the people who write for the Post are against self-published books. It's because there's just too much. We have to have some kind of line. And there's still so many books being published the traditional way, those have to be paid attention to. So that's what you need to, you know, part of what you need to know about book reviewing um, as an author or a would-be author. But Marion and Jacob and I have also published books ourselves the traditional way um, with different traditional publishers. So I thought it would be great if we could talk a little bit about that and talk a bit um, also, Nora, from your perspective, about how books catch a reviewer's eye, because I think that might be helpful. Agreed? Yeah. Okay. So um, just so you know, I'll give the bona fides for myself since they're not, not in the bio. I, I, <laughs> I'm kind of bad like that. So I've written two books for National Geographic. One, and this is when it was still a society and it wasn't Rupert Murdoch's baby. So um, different process these days probably, but I wrote An Uncommon History of Common Things in 2009 with John Thompson, and then wrote um, An Uncommon History of Common Courtesy, came out in 2011. I edited an anthology called The Books That Changed My Life for Reagan Arts in 2016. And I'm working on a memoir for Counterpoint Press right now. Um, and I will let uh, Jacob and Marion talk about their books. Sure. Uh, so let's see. I have one published book and a couple unpublished <laughs> ones. Uh, <laughs> I didn't even mention those. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I wrote a book called about a called Terms of Service about social media and online surveillance, privacy, those kinds of issues. Basically a critique of the big tech companies. That came out in 2015 from HarperCollins. Um, it was definitely a good experience in a lot of ways. It was a very eye-opening one into how publishing works and the various kinds of treatment people, I think, can get uh, depending on what your situation is, um, what kind of publisher you're with, what the pub how the publisher internally values your book, which is something that I hadn't very thought about. Interesting. Yep. And uh, I mean, I don't want to be too sort of self-lacerating or or self-pitying or something, but I, I got the feeling that my publisher did not really value my book very highly and just sort of dumped it on the market and that doesn't help. You know, but, that yeah. is um, an intangible in book publishing that really can make a difference if you're writing, um, if you're do choosing between submitting through an agent to a trade publishing house or self-publishing. Um, because you have more control if you self-publish. And a lot of writers think, oh, I got a $50,000 advance, but if the publisher doesn't value your book in-house, that means a difference in PR, a difference in marketing, a difference in sales support. It's really yeah. important. Yeah, and I experienced a lot of those things, I think. Uh, I mean, it wasn't all bad, but um, it was interesting just to see that sort of play out and to go through the, the whole writing and publishing experience as very much a learning experience. I mean, first I had to learn how to really write a book, and then um, I think what's good about going through the traditional publishing route is it does sort of arm you for the future uh, and hopefully teach you some things about um, how to stand up for yourself, how to ne negotiate your path if you need to, um, what you should uh, get from your publisher or your agent, and what you should not expect from them. Um, so right now I'm kind of, uh, 
I guess, agentless again. I'm pitching agents again, which is an interesting experience. Um, and pitching them a novel, um, which is, for those who don't know, um, most nonfiction books are sold to um, publishers on proposal by an agent. And um, that proposal might be 40, 50, 60 pages, have a sample chapter, things like that. A lot of fiction is uh, sold as a full, um, fairly finished manuscript. So it's a, it's a different kind of process. Uh, certainly more labor of love, um, as so much writing is these days. But um, yeah, and that's something else I'd be glad to talk about, what it's like pitching agents, but I'll pass it on. I'm just, I really wonder like what you guys want to know about. Um, <laughs> is that a question, question for me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, a burning question. Okay. Would you like to continue the moderation? I'm oh, sorry. No. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, it's fine. Um, I just, I just, but keep going. But um, well, I just thought I couldn't think of what story to tell, and I thought, what, what would they possibly? What do they want to know? I mean, I I have had a, a not the exact same thing, but I, my first three books were Random House, and then um, you know, my, my sales weren't that great, so they said, well, we love you, but you have to go, and then I have worked with smaller and smaller publishers ever since. Like, uh, I was published by Seal. I was published by this place called Globe Pequot. That, um, and then now I'm at Counterpoint, which is like a great publisher. But even how, does it's small. Self, how does the self-published Yeah, so um, how does the self-published, I mean, it, first of all, it's, uh, it's almost impossible that, to get coverage in standard book sections. You know this already. So I think you have to go, like they just, if, didn't Beth Ann just say they just won't, or they won't do it. They just don't do it. Um, to, no, there is a way. There's just not a way to get into the newspaper book section. So there's lit blog. There's literary bloggers, like I, like I mentioned, and those really are important. They are valued by the industry. They so are. you know, um, and those are places that will take a look. So there's the whole lit blogging world. There's um, Kirkus has. So how do you Kirk when you just read it and see if you like it. You know, there's books, left, there's this, there's bookish, there's there's a lot of them. I mean, if you you Google, you start seeing, you'll see ones that you like, okay. and um, that's just one way to get attention. I can um, take that too. Oh, yeah. Okay, here. I just want to say, yes. we don't, We. I mean, there are, are being someone who works at a place where trade, we newspaper. Do not <laughs> apologize. But I mean, it's, I, I should say it's not, it's not true that we don't ever look at self-published or small published or books that come out from small publishers. At, that's it's different. It's self, different. Self-published. Self-published. No, we, we do. I mean, we have and we do. And it's not, I, don't, I would definitely say that it is not like we look at the spine and say, who does this come from? Like, we look at the, what it's about. <clears throat> like, is there something intriguing about the subject, about the author? Is it relevant like to some issue that we think people are really interested in? I mean, I can only speak for myself because that's what I, I mean, I get this cart of books that comes to my desk every single day. And I, I look at all of them and you know, it, it's a lot. And I definitely do not, the first thing I look at is not the publisher, absolutely not. And if I saw something was self-published, I, I can say for myself that I would still look at it. So I remember but doing one. I, I just remember that I did one um, self-published author for Newsday, and um, it was because it was a Long Island author, and Newsday is Long Island. So I think you know things like that, where there's some kind of niche that you regional, fit in, regional, regional, but also like um, niches that you fit in. Like if your book is about autism, and there's a magazine. Well, about let it. me yeah, do that. No, and then I'll go back because I think that's really important. Um, I just wanted to. Con to finish answering the question about lit blogs, and then let's talk about niche marketing. Um, so the literary blogosphere, I started in a way as a lit blogger. It's kind of, my path is a little strange because I was working as a books editor at AOL, and blogs had just begun, and so they said, start an AOL journal, and you need a title for it, and the tipping point had just come out. And so, the word maven was really popular. This is how I became the book maven, which is where I tweet. And um, 
So I started this blog, and it was really popular. And when I got laid off, because that's what happens at AOL, any ex AOLers in the audience? <laughs> <laughs> you know, reorgs, reorgs, reorgs. Um, Publishers Weekly asked me to blog for them. I did that for a couple of years. Um, when I moved on from Publishers Weekly, I blogged for Barnes and Noble. Um, so, uh, first of all, the industry does pay, as Marianne said, a lot of attention to bloggers. It isn't always easy to find them. I would say be very careful. Google, for instance, let's say you've written a romance novel. Google romance book bloggers, lit bloggers, romances, so on and so forth. Um, you'll start to see lists. You'll start to see people who are, and, and I want to get back to Jacob in a minute, too, to talk about social media and how it's ruined everything. <laughs> uh, because, but, but this is, um, lit bloggers are paid attention to by the industry, PR people, marketing people, they look at the blogs. And so if you can say, let's say you wrote a romance set in Civil War Winchester, and you found a blogger who loves Virginia romance, Virginia-based romance, you can get a review with that blogger and then maybe um, one of her colleagues is going to pick up on it. So I think you do have to be creative when you're self-published about getting reviews, but there are places, and I want um, Marianne to finish talking about niches like autism resources. And then Jacob, let's uh, talk a little bit about social media and, um, and books coverage. When you say you're looking at it, of course, what does that mean? Do you read the jacket copy? Do you see, do you open it up? Do you, what do you do? Do you look at the subject matter? How do you I mean, it depends. what in the card book <coughs> is actually going to go either into, into your bag that night to read or you're going to assign to someone else? Um, well, I mean, among the staff, there are people who are interested in certain subjects, and so they get sort of sorted out by those people. So already things are winnowed down to like, you know, I might be inter I'm interested in memoir. So if they're all, all the memoirs are given to me. And mysteries and thrillers. And mysteries and thrillers and, that, and some other things. And so, um, you know, I'll take this back and I don't know, I mean, I can't say how far. Sometimes I take something home and then I read a lot of it and I decide not to do it and sometimes I see something and I immediately am just drawn to it for some reason. But also, I mean, it's not just the, the cart though, I mean, it's just, I mean, I am inundated with emails every second um, and so sometimes I'll have the email in my head and I've seen something on Twitter, I've seen something on social media about a subject or a book or whatever and it all sort of comes together and that might draw me toward something. Um, so that's why I, before we can get started, I mean, I don't necessarily, I mean, social media is like, you know, good and bad. I mean, it creates an awareness about a subject and a book, and it can be really useful, um, you know, to getting our, you know, attention generally. Um, so I don't think there's like one hard and fast rule, like I read like 30 pages of every book. I, it's just, it's a, it's a lot of factors. Um, we should talk about social media because that's something you can do for your book. And you, even if you had a publisher, they would be telling you, you have to get out, you have to do social media, you have to do, and it's really, really important part of it. And Bookstagram is this part of Twitter that's about books, and it's it, it's become really powerful. Bethann should really talk about this because you know so much more about it than I do. Uh, you know, and or start with no, you. Okay. Jacob, he knows because that too. You, you, know, you, you know, social media has done some powerful things, but also some really negative things. So sure. could you talk about that in terms of books? Yeah, I mean, I think... And, and cultural criticism. Yeah, I think uh, social media and the web in general are great for book discovery and sort of cultural discovery. I think one of the problems is it turns a lot of us into sort of recommendation machines. Uh, I mean, service journalism... That's me. <laughs> which... Is, is a, I was about to say, service journalism has been around forever, you know, and so lists and recommendations and summer reads and things like that, that's always been part of the culture and should not be sort of dismissed out of hand, but at the same time, 
there's arguably less room for more considered writing. Yeah. And I think what makes it hard also for writers is you're, for better and worse, you're, we're all sort of our own publicists now and constantly flogging our work and ourselves even. And there's a way in which, which like influencer culture or whatever you want to call it, or just advertising culture in general has pervaded social media uh, and that extends to literary and book social media. And for some people that's a comfortable place to be. They're glad to be constantly connecting with other writers and fans and, and just general people online and to be posting about their latest piece of writing and everything like that. Um, for others, like I, I just don't take to that very well, though I, I sort of try to do a little bit of it because it, it seems increasingly essential. Um, so I think that is something that can be empowering to people. It can also feel, I think, sort of stifling and kind of like we have this monoculture of everyone just uh, begging each other for likes and, we, and retweets and things like that. I, and that is definitely one that I can um, speak to both with experience and a story. So uh, I mentioned all this blogging experience that I have and I started you know, doing more and more reviews and author profiles and it's just, it's, it's talk about a niche, that's my niche. I don't really seem to want to write about anything else. I don't, <laughs> um, I don't know, maybe I'm not a deep thinker, I'm not sure. My, my thing is really getting into an author's mind. I really, um, I really love that. And so, at a certain point when I had started to write um, more essays and more personal pieces, I went to a, a conference, a convention, and was sitting you know, with the end of day, well-earned adult beverage in front of a big fireplace with a friend who's a bookseller. And she said, so you're doing more writing and I really like your writing. I said, thanks. And she said, do you really want to keep going after the clicks and page views? And I thought, no, I have 213,000 followers now on Twitter. I don't want to ignore those followers. I don't want to take them for granted. I love them. I think they're wonderful. Um, I started a hashtag called Friday Reads in 2009 that allows people to share um, what they're reading online, but I'll never forget something. Um, the guy who started the library thing said to me once, he said, you know, it's great, everyone recommends stuff, like Jacob was saying, but there's no other conversation about it. And I have never had the time or the inclination or the support to actually turn that into you know, something more. And so for me, the something more really became my own writing. And uh, so I agree a lot. I, social media is absolutely essential when you have a book done and you need to promote it, and you can build that social media while you're writing, you can build your platform, and unfortunately that is part of the commercial aspect of publishing today that none of us can ignore, is um, building a platform. But ultimately, it comes back, if you're a writer, to the writing. And so I think um, it's true that social media sometimes is a little too, well, it's a lot superficial. But with that, I do definitely want to turn to question, more questions. And then after questions, um, I want Marion, please, to read one more piece from the Baltimore Book of the Dead. So right back here. She wrote Mostly Dead Things, fantastic debut novel. And she's amazing on Twitter anyway, so that helps. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm just wondering, other than Twitter and gallery copies for a first-time novelist, how would pre-order copies even happen? Anyone? Anyone? When they know it right away. Well, <laughs> um, that's right. The reason people do pre-orders in general is because they are they know the author and they know they're going to like it and they want to make sure they get it right away. So that's something that is less of a factor with debut novelists because they're debuting. But um, so I mean I think that's where social trying to build some m momentum on social media really makes sense. You know, um, tweeting to making tweeting to book, book editors, tweeting on Bookstagram, like just trying to get your name out there and your book out there and get it on people's minds That's by... That's the superficial working. Yeah. <laughs> but um, 
Are, are pre-orders so important? I mean, I never even thought it mattered about pre-orders. They're pre -orders. huge now. Oh, okay, well, yeah. see, I, this is why my books have never sold. I, I, don't, I don't really know how it works. <laughs> I would just add that um, even if you're a debut author of some sort, um, there are probably opportunities for you to publish things in advance of when your book comes out. Um, even if you're not publishing short fiction in the New Yorker, um, you, could, you might publish a personal essay about some topic related to your book in a smaller publication or something like that. Regional newspaper. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, I mean, as writers, we're constantly, for better and worse, mining our own lives for materials. So that's sort of when that comes in handy is when you do have something to promote or when you're trying to um, push something or, or kind of make a name for yourself. That's when you start looking back at what do I, what do I have to say or what do I have to say to introduce this book to the world? Other questions? Oh, thank you. <laughs> I don't know why she's holding up a 10 minute I think she shot. Just did on <laughs> How much per word? <laughs> yeah. I'll start. Um, I will say that um, Marion, you know, gets a lot of assignments from Kirkus, right? Do you choose the books? No. I okay, mean, exactly. And I don't choose the books for People Magazine, and I don't choose the books for Newsday. I mean, it's really, really rare. That's why I started my podcast, because I'm the boss of that. So mm -hmm. if I want to re do a book that's no one's assigning me, I can still do it. Exactly. So I was going to say, um, and I want you to talk more about that. Um, I choose a lot of the books that I review, not completely though. Um, for instance, I do a roundup for a magazine called Virtuoso Life where I review mostly dead things. Um, and I choose those books with my editor, but you know, I give him 10, we window it down to five, we argue about a couple of them, you know. So that is something where I might lift up a, a debut novelist, for example. Um, for the Washington Post, I argue back and forth with my editors, you know, hey, I mean, with, never with Nora, I never argue with her. <laughs> but I'll give um, Steph, um, our boss, <laughs> uh, my editor, uh, you know, a list of here are the ones I'm interested in for August, and she'll come back and say, okay, these are the two that I want, because she knows more in a more focused way you know, about the audience, about the demographics, about what's working, what other reviews, you know, are getting read, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then for Lit Hub, I write a column every month called Five Books You May Have Missed. And that is where I really choose very quirky university press novels. Um, for instance, um, this month, one of the ones I'll be covering is called Blue Hours by Daphne Calate, who is a very well-known author, but um, this is from, I think it's from University of Nebraska Press? Northwestern. Nor uh, Northwestern, thank you, Cliff. Um, and so I'm really delighted to be able to show readers something that they probably wouldn't see anywhere else. But in, um, on the radio show, Marion, what do, how do you make choices? Well, my sh my show um, is only books I like. Um, I, I, I only have four minutes, right? So I only do two books a week, and I do two minute reviews of them. And I just don't see the point of devoting, you know, time to putting things down. And I think that there's so many great novels that are coming out all the time. So I just, um, you know, I think. What books do I most wa want to press on people? Like if they, you know, if you came in my house, what's the book I you, know, you take this, and this is what I'm doing all the time is giving people books, and so it's sort of an extension of, you know, giving people books. Like for I and I get to read books in advance because of these jo you know jobs I have, so I know what's coming out that's good, and um, so I wait till it, you know, like for example, I um, got an early copy of Ann Patchett's next novel that's coming out pretty soon. And, and you know, I loved it. I'm so excited. I you know, it's so, so good. So as soon as it comes out, <laughs> Sorry, I'll be so putting it on the radio show. I'm so review it after uh, yes, <laughs> it's just um, it's I, it's I want to I really want to help my fellow writers, and I'm really supportive of other people's careers. And I do I I do this thing where 
you know, I can't review my friends because you're not supposed to. But um, I, so I do Q and A's features with with Baltimore writers that I'm friends with for this Baltimore fishbowl thing. I mean, I'm not doing, you know, I have my, this podcast of mine and this Baltimore fishbowl are pretty two bit compared to, you know, the New Yorker and all this stuff. But for me, it's satisfying because I work in places that I have some control over. You know, I spent decades sending things out and getting rejections. So now I mostly do things where I try to, you know, I mostly do things where I'm in charge. And um, Baltimore Fishbowl is like that. So I, I tell the publisher, I want to do a Q&A this month with this uh, new, you know, with this writer. I just did one for a, what do you call it? Bi Non-binary writer named Tyler Mendelson that I knew from, because she was in the MFA program that I taught. Well, obviously I can't review their book, because, did I already say she? Their, their book, because, you know, I was their teacher. But I can do a fee, I can do a Q and A. So that's another way I support writers' careers. I mean, I do see myself more as a booster type of person than a savage, mean critic. You know, not that I've never not liked a book, but it, you know, I, it, it breaks my heart, you know, to have, when I don't like a book, because I can just picture the person out there, like, you know, and it's happened to me a lot. With First Comes Love, which is the memoir of my first marriage and how my husband died of AIDS when my kids were really little. Some of the reviews of this book were so mean. It was literally it was unbelievable like, that people would be so personal and so searing in, you know, their attack. It was very ad hominem, you know, criticizing me as a person more than the writing of the book or anything. So I guess having been through such a, oh, so much trial by fire, I, you know, like, I don't want that on my radio show. <laughs> you don't want to strike the match. Yeah. <laughs> question, other questions? Um, right here and then right here and then we'll probably have to, I know there's another question, we'll see if we can squeeze them in. Go ahead, Neil. Um, this is for you. Uh, I, I love, absolutely love reading books and I don't think that, I, I, I can honestly say, I don't think there's a book in the book I didn't love. Um, I have, a, my life is books, I, I am into so I get very, I feel intimate with the books that I'm reading, but I get in like the plot, but something about the character, some, I find something that always pulls me in rather than sticking me out. And Love so that. when you say that you wrote the book, uh, 10 things that absolutely changed my life, I would like, maybe you would consider if you write a book, the other 100,000 books that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, my the book that I edited was a collection of interviews I did with authors about a book that actually changed their life. It wasn't their favorite book, and it was, but it's really fun. Um, unfortunately, it's out of print. Otherwise, um, I would hope it would be on the table outside. But I will recommend um, my colleague James Mustich, who was at the Barnes and Noble Review for years and before that. What did Jim do? I, a big, big, important job. But anyway. He just released a book called 1,000 Books to Read Before You Die. Oh, and, yeah, and I would highly recommend that because he is a really, he's a really discerning reader. And so I think that's a wonderful idea. I did try, I, it's a long story of much heartache that I won't go into here. I tried to write a book called um, The History of the World in 100 Books. Um, at one point, and um, it got to contract and then blah, blah, blah. But anyway, I think it's so um, fascinating that there is a book for every reader, and um, you also, it, the book doesn't have to be a perfect book to be beloved, so that's what you're saying. So I totally appreciate that. Thank you. Right here. Um, I have to my style of writing very similar to people in the world, but uh, I'm a screenplay writer. Okay. I think it's such a fascinating topic for anyone who writes anything in here because you could be blocked writing a novel, you could be blocked writing an op-ed, you could be blocked writing a note for 
excusing your child from school. So. <laughs> <laughs> then you know you have problems. Yeah. I mean, I think there are a couple aspects to it. I think first, what, what's important is to view it as temporary and not let sort of a momentary block become some sort of greater spiritual existential crisis, which I'm not even joking. Like, we all can approach our work, our writing, or art with great anxiety sometimes, and you can suddenly think, like, I can't do anything, I can't write anything. But um, just a more practical steps, I think being, whether you're a screenwriter or, or writing book reviews or writing a novel, I think being constantly engaged with art, with um, watching movies, write, uh, reading, is really important. Even, and maybe especially not even doing, some, reading or consuming something in the genre in which you're composing. Um, other than that, I don't know, I'm actually dealing with something kind of similar in that I'm like 20,000 words into, uh, into what I hope to be a novel and I suddenly, I'm not totally with uh, loss, but suddenly I'm, I'm like, okay, I've established everything I need to establish, now what? Yeah. Um, and for me, I'm just sort of trying to go back through and write in small pieces, you know, not sort of spell out the whole plot or develop the whole plot for myself right away do what I can, where I can, and uh, see how that sort of develops. Besides just going back and kind of immersing myself in, in work that I hope will be inspiring or I can rip off of in some way. Oh, I think, we, I, I think gonna, unfortunately, oh, yeah. You want to close, okay. so. Uh, because next time I'll make this all questions because clearly everyone has a lot of them. Um, this is the first time around, so everyone come back next year, okay? <laughs> um, uh, do we have time for just the reading? Oh, excellent. Okay. So, Marion, I'm going to say thank you and goodbye and then close on Marion's reading about Caroline Mapp. And um, thank you so much, all three of you, for being here and agreeing to sort of, you know, do the Wild West uh, questions here with me. And thank you all in 1455, of course. And Marion Winnick, The Baltimore Book of the Dead. Thank you. Actually, this one is from the Glenrock Book of the Dead, which oh, was the, pre the predecessor. I wrote them in 10 years apart. A lot more people died in the 10 years. So. <laughs> How convenient. <laughs> uh, this is called The Competition, died 2002. We were the same age. We went to the same college. We both wrote for alternative newspapers. And we each, in 1996, published a memoir about our troubles so far. I did heroin, she drank vodka. I had bulimia, she had anorexia. I was widowed, she was in recovery. First I heard of her was when her book arrived on the New York Times bestseller list, quote, a remarkable exercise in self-discovery. Mine was too, sort of, quote, if you can imagine Edie Sedgwick mutating into Donna Reed, unquote. I stared at her author photo, her high, clear forehead, her mane of blonde hair. The beginning is terrific, I told people after I read it. The stuff about the glasses and the ice cubes and how much she loved to drink. But after she got sober, it was kind of boring. Could you tell those boyfriends apart? My next book was about single motherhood. Hers was about how much she loved her dog. When I heard the eulogy on NPR, saw the obituary in the Times, I was blindsided. Lung cancer? 42? Are you kidding me? Now she was on my mind even more of the time. When I fell in love with a miniature dachshund a couple of years later, I finally read her chronicle of interspecies passion, but all I could do about it now was hug my dog. That summer, I was back in Providence where we'd both once gone to school. It was June, and the students were moving out, their belongings in piles on the sidewalk. And there, among the stereo speakers and economics texts, I found a miniature Blue's Clues armchair for my daughter, and on the ground beside it, a paperback copy of Drinking, a Love Story. I snatched it up and hugged it as if it were written by my sister, the one I never met.